And from the Kofan then, he began to the first of his many epic river journeys that frankly dwarfed the achievements of Richard Bruce. And in dugout canoes, he sailed all the way down the Putumayo River. And in doing so, he ended up going through a glass darkly and coming into the shadow of one of the most horrific um, events that had ever occurred in the history of South America. All of it was about this tree. The Indians, of course, called it caucho, the weeping tree, and for generations they had been slicing into its cambium to gather the white latex, which they formed into strange objects. Uh, Columbus, for example, saw Arawakan Indians playing with balls that bounced and flew, and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin thought it was very useful for rubbing off their pencil notations, and since they thought it came from India, they called it India rubber. But of course it came from the Amazon, and the Portuguese had already established a fledging cottage industry, but there was just one problem. In hot weather, a rubber cape melted like a sticky shroud, and in cold, water, in cold weather, a pair of rubber boots cracked like porcelain. And it was only the serendipitous discovery of vulcanization by Charles Goodyear that transformed rubber from a, a curiosity into a vital commodity of the industrial age. And when that happened, the flash of wealth was mesmerizing. In 1888, John Dunlop invented the rubber tire so that his kid could win a tricycle race in Belfast. By 1898, a decade later, there were 50 automobile companies in America alone. Oldsmobile, the biggest, made 425 cars in 1901. But within another decade, Henry Ford would be making the first of 15 million Model Ts. And all of them needed rubber, and the only source was the Amazon. The, the wealth was simply incredible, and within, um, by 1910, rubber um, made up over 40% of all of Brazil's export. In Pittsburgh, steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie lamented, I should have chosen rubber. In Paris and London, men flipped coins to decide whether to go after gold in the Klondike or black gold in the Amazon. In Manaus, situated at the heart of the trade, men slaked the thirst of their horses with chilled buckets of champagne while their women sent their laundry back to Portugal to be clean because they disdained the murky waters of the Amazon. And all of this was made possible because of three species in the genus Hevea that grew broadly dispersed across the Amazon basin as a biological, ecological adaptation to protect them from their main predator, which was a pernicious fungal disease called the South American leaf blight, which invariably proved catastrophic if rubber trees were concentrated in plantations in the Americas. And that Accident of biology determined the economics of the trade. In order to get to the rubber, the trees scattered through the forest, perhaps 300 million individuals of Hevea brasiliensis alone, you had to mobilize huge amounts of labor. And when even the influx of thousands of impoverished peasants from the Brazilian northeast proved inadequate, insufficient to the task, the rubber barons had to turn to the Indian people of the forest, and now they had a quandary. How does, do you secure to the yoke of the trade indigenous people who faced with adversity could simply flee into the forest? And the solution was terror. And the horrific abuses unleashed upon women and children and men in the rubber era defies imaginings. One priest who was there on the Rio Putumayo, which became known as the River of Death, said to Schultes that the best thing that could be said about white people in that era was that they didn't kill their Indians for sport. And so as the trade flourished, the Indians suffered. And in the end, for every ton of rubber produced, 10 Indians would die and hundreds of others be left scarred for life. And in the end, perhaps ironically, what saved the Indian people was an act of British imperial policy. The rubber seed is very susceptible to fermentation, and it was only with the arrival of fast steamships that the British could actually safely get rubber, viable rubber seeds out of Brazil, which they did. They got to Liverpool, a royal train took them to special hothouses at Kew, and eventually, with special glass deck of ships, they were shipped overseas to the Royal Botanic Garden in Singapore, and there they could be grown in plantation because the South American leaf blight does not exist there. 
And once these plantations came online, the reversal of fortunes was incredible. In 1910, Brazil still produced roughly half the world's rubber supply, but by 1934, as automobile manufacturing surpassed a million units for the first time, Brazil had become a net importer of the product that she had given the world. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. This was the situation in December 8, 1941, when Richard Evans Schultes, at a mission post near Makoa on the Putumayo, heard crackling over the radio news of Pearl Harbor. At this point in time, U.S. domestic consumption of rubber was 600,000 uh, metric tons, all of it coming in from Southeast Asia, where 97% of the world's rubber production was grown. Within six weeks, the Japanese had taken all of it, and we were in a perilous, perilous situation. Every Sherman tank had 20 tons of rubber, and, uh, 20 tons of steel, and half a ton of rubber. Every battleship sunk at Pearl Harbor had 30,000 rubber parts. Every mile of wiring at every domestic and military insta installation throughout the free world was insulated with latex cut from a tree. It was an incredible crisis to which the government responded. The speed limit dropped in America for 30 miles an hour, to 30 miles an hour, not for want of petroleum, but to protect our, our modest rubber supplies that came from Liberia and what we could get from wild type from the Amazon. Um, the Allies only got through 1943 with the most massive recycling campaign in the history of the world. You could turn in rubber products at 400,000 depots in America alone. Even Roosevelt's dog Fala had his pet bones, his rubber bones, melted down. Secondly, the the government sent the order to the synthetic chemists if they couldn't find a way to make a million metric tons of serviceable synthetic rubber within a year and a million metric tons of the precursors at a time when the U.S. domestic gross domestic product was $98.7 billion dollars at, and, and, and direct orders to government, a million dollars rather, direct orders to government in the first year of war surpassed $100 million. So there was a huge competition for material and men. All would be lost. We had no precursor for synthetic rubber. Uh, DuPont made 4,000 tons of a serviceable rubber for battery casings, but that was it, useless for tires. The third order was to send botanical explorers under the urgency of wartime conditions to every corner of the free world to squeeze every drop of latex out of every latex-bearing plant we could find. We had Russian dandelions growing in 43 states and seven Canadian prov provinces as a source of latex. And Schultes, given his expertise in the Amazon, was given the most difficult task of all, to go back and squeeze latex, not out of the forest, but to persuade Indian people who not a generation before had been tortured for the, in the midst of the rubber, um, uh, the, the first rubber boom, he had to persuade them to go back in the forest to secure rubber for an allied effort of which they knew nothing. But he managed to do it. And he had heard that the mother load was on a river called the Apoporis, which was completely unknown, represented on maps of Colombia by a dotted red line 1,500 miles in length. The Carijona, supposedly a cannibalistic tribe, lived in the mythical headwaters. And Schultes then began a series of incredible expeditions, cutting tracks through the forest, dragging boats 14 days across corduroy roads, reaching into these rivers, and eventually discovering the very mountains that today bear his name, the national park that is named for him, mountains that no other explorer had seen, Cerro Campania, deeply significant to Makuna mythology. And in all these months, Schultes used to say he had to cover his eyes as he walked through the forest for fear of seeing yet another new species that he was not able to collect. And then his mission, having gotten to the headwaters of the Apoporos, he was to go down the river counting rubber trees as he went along to estimate how much rubber could be extracted from this remote drainage. He was told no matter what he did, don't go belong beyond the cataracts of Hirihirimo, where the entire river disappears beneath the earth for five kilometers. He was declared lost and presumed dead in September of 1943, and four months later, word reached Bogota from an isolated Catholic mission 
that an American botanist who actually acted more English than American was painting their church blue. And what this meant is that Schultes, having run out of gas, had traveled the entire length of the river so sacred to the Makuna. In seven months, he counted 17,000 rubber trees. He estimated that the drainage contained 16 million trees altogether that could yield 6.5 million pounds for the rubber air effort. But increasingly, by the end of 1943, the Allies realized that this effort to secure latex wasn't going to make much difference. Even at the height of the rubber boom, when 5,000 adventurers a week poured into the Amazon, Brazil produced but 50,000 metric tons. We now had to produce a million metric tons in the, to fuel the most important industrial expansion in the history of civilization, the arming of the Allied cause. So increasingly, the efforts of the plant explorers in 1943 shifted from securing raw tonnage of latex to solving the ultimate problem, to find a way to grow rubber in the Americas despite the blight, so that never again would we be held hostage by a foreign power taking control of the plantations of Southeast Asia. It wasn't as if the captains of industry hadn't known about the problem. Henry Ford, at the height of his power, spent $25 million in the 1920s at a place of, called Fordlandia and later Belterra. He sent his agronomists to Southeast Asia where they begged, borrowed, or stole the finest clonal um, material of Hevia brasiliensis. Now this is critical because the botanists in Southeast Asia had figured out that the best way to increase latex yield was to propagate the plant vegetatively, not from seed. And that meant that the entire plantation industry was essentially a single genetic clone of the handful of seeds that Wickham took out in 1877. And when they brought that material back into the Amazon and planted it on an area of land half the size of Connecticut, Everything seemed fine until the leaves flushed out. And then the blight that was virulent, uh, was latent in the forest became virulent in the plantations. And I spoke to a pathologist who was there at the time, and he said it was as if God himself had a blowtorch that simply eliminated the investment. And out of that disaster came the greatest fear. It was shown that the process of selecting for high yield in Southeast Asia had made ecotypes even more susceptible to the blight, which meant that if the blight ever got over there, it could mean the end of the industry. But out of disaster came hope, because out of the millions of trees that died, a handful survived wild type from around the Amazon. That suggested the possibility that somewhere in this forest, like looking for a needle in a proverbial haystack, you could find the real bleeders, high-yielding, disease-resistant rubber trees. And Schultes was sent out on that quixotic mission to find those trees. And for three years, he lived in the forest seeking those individual hevia trees. Finally, in the homeland of the Tacuna Indians, in the environs of Leticia, he found them. He spent three tapping seasons with the Serengeros, studying 6,000 individual hevia trees as if they were his children. And every year, he collected himself with his helpers over 600,000, sometimes a million hevia seeds, each one of which had to be individually inspected and cleaned, placed in sawdust, and flown out to the agricultural research stations in Costa Rica and the Caribbean. And this was the germplasm that was going to be the basis of an American-based, disease-resistant rubber industry. Well, with the end of the war, um, the crisis seemed to be resolved. The dream of the rubber explorers was about to be realized.